Lecture 17 uh, covers the following uh, topic. Uh, we begin by the exact solutions of heat equation and how it is uh, solved numerically. In the context, we uh, try to tell you the importance of uh, applying the boundary conditions, because uh, unlike theoretical uh, solution method, numerical method needs definitive boundary conditions. And in the context of uh, analyzing numerical methods, we need to talk about uh, how the solution behaves over large time. And this brings us to the topic of asymptotic solution. This we do via an energy analysis and we distinguish what is a physically stable and what is an unstable solution. Uh, we need to uh, distinguish between these two cases. This is what is going to be a constant theme in this course. We need to see that uh, uh, discretizing physically unstable solution is a challenge, because uh, we need to capture the physical instability while not allowing any numerical instability of the method. So, that is why we are going to talk about numerical stability accuracy and the consistency of the method. And in the context of the heat equation, we will begin uh, in the same historic manner in which the subject has developed by introducing forward in time, center in space scheme or the FTCA scheme. And for this FTCA scheme, uh, using our spectral analysis, we will obtain an estimate for the numerical amplification factor, which we will see is going to be a function of spatial and time steps given in terms of a number, which we will call of the Peclet number. We will uh, figure out what a critical value of Peclet number is for a particular numerical method. And for the FTCS method, we will uh, identify a specific uh, ranges of Peclet numbers over which solutions will have different types of qualitative behavior. Having uh, discussed about FTCS method, we will show that at times, if we are little more restrictive in terms of spatial and temporal discretization, we can get higher accuracy. And one such method is due to Milne. We will talk about it. This will be followed by our discussion of uh, handling uh, boundary conditions, which are not given in terms of the function value, but in terms of its derivative. So, these are called the Neumann boundary conditions. So, we will talk about the Neumann boundary condition and how they are used using ghost uh, boundary concept. <coughs> Since we have uh, realized that accuracy is one of our requirement, we will also follow a, an attempt, a failed attempt by Richardson, which uh, was uh, developed uh, to achieve higher accuracy, but what we found, uh, people found out that this gives rise to spurious modes, because this is a three time level method and this spurious mode actually makes the method also unstable and we would not uh, uh, be uh, suggesting that anyone use Richardson method. This will be followed by another variation uh, of a uh, higher order approach, uh, which was suggested by Dufort and Frankel. And we will notice that if we are not careful in choosing uh, delta x and delta t, we may actually end up having inconsistency problem. That means, although we are solving a parabolic partial differential equation, uh, numerically it would uh, behave like a hyperbolic differential equation. Done it specifically uh, on purpose for a finite domain, uh, x uh, non-dimensionalized, so that it uh, lies between 0 and 1. And, uh, uh, you start off with some initial condition at t equal to 0, that is given the second line. <coughs> and then you study the evolution of the solution with uh, space and time. However, because you have a finite domain, so there is a possibility that uh, you could apply some uh, input through those boundaries, uh, which we will call them as uh, boundary conditions. And, um, they are at fixed x's at 0 and 1. Uh, however, those conditions could be time dependent, right. So, there is a possibility that we could do that. And uh, 
I probably uh, did not uh, amplify boundary conditions uh, that we usually talk about. They are uh, uh, classified into three categories. One is called uh, the Dirichlet condition. Uh, then we have uh, what is called as Norman condition, and third is uh, what is called as the mixed or Robbins boundary condition. Okay. <clears throat> Well, uh, if you give a function, uh, value of the function itself at the boundaries, that is what you call as the Dirichlet condition. So, what you are seeing here is an example of Dirichlet condition. You are prescribing the solution u at the two ends. And this of course, uh, we studied that it is a parabolic PD with uh, t equal to constant as the characteristic, a uh, single characteristic it is not plural, uh, you just have only one and uh, you want to study this problem before you study it uh, computationally, you would like to investigate uh, what is the attribute of the solution in a theoretical framework. For example, if we go to very large time, what happens to the solution? Does the solution exist? Does it remain unique? Is it uh, bounded? All this uh, mathematical questions crop up in our mind. So, to study that aspect, what we did, uh, we defined a functional uh, which I called as u square by 2. <coughs> of course, if u is the temperature, u square by 2 does not mean anything, but if u is some kind of a velocity, then this has a connotation of an energy, right. So, that is why I said energy. So, but please do understand within quotes, this is energy in that sense that if u is the temperature, then by no means I will call that as physical energy, but still the main property of this function is that it is non-negative. right? So, if I have a quantity which is non-negative, I want to find out how this quantity changes with time. So, what we did was just simply differentiated it with respect to time, then we will get u del u del t and since del u del t is equal to u x x from the governing equation, I can write this and then do this bit of manipulation, you get a perfect differential in the first part minus u x square. So, I can integrate this part that will be u u x at 1 minus u u x at 0. So, those are those two uh, parts of the solution and the last one is simply minus u x square d x. Now, we could consider various sub cases. For example, um, if we do not give in any kind of boundary input, that means uh, this Dirichlet condition we talked about are 0, then uh, you can see this first two parts uh, disappear, uh, leaving behind this uh, time rate as minus of u x square. And once again, uh, because of the negative sign and this being a square, you appreciate that uh, this d e d t is uh, negative, well non-positive, it could be 0 also. <coughs> So, what it means actually that we start off with a quantity which itself is positive, but which is decaying with time. right? So, what happens then that is a attribute of what I called as a physically stable system. In a physically stable system what happens that as time progresses nothing goes unbounded. right? So, here is an example where we started with a finite energy E and then that kept on decreasing. Uh, this is quite understandable, uh, because if I take uh, this example as a say heat in a rod, then what we are doing at t equal to 0, we are providing some kind of a temperature distribution and then we are seeing what is happening with it as time progresses. What do we expect to happen? Of course, it will slowly uh, conduct and convect heat away and temperature would come down, that is what we expect. So, that is an attribute of a physically stable system that this E would uh, uh, keep on decaying and then if I am uh, doing my computation quite uh, uh, all right, then one of the big principles that we must uh, satisfy 
is that uh, we should be able to compute it uh, for indefinite period of time without this quantity E uh, blowing up on our face. However, in some physical unstable system, you can see that this quantity d e d t can be positive and how can it be positive? That clue is given in the previous slide. You can see here that if I produce some kind of a uh, heat addition through this uh, two terms, I can make this quantity either 0 or plus. right? So, it is very simple. If I take once again an example of a rod, then if I keep on adding heat from both the sides, then of course, the temperature will grow and if the temperature grows, then this d d t can keep on increasing. So, that is what we meant by a physically unstable system. <coughs> However, there is uh, a kind of a inherent danger here that if uh, unstable system really goes unbounded, uh, computationally we would not be able to follow unbounded numbers, you know, because all computing is done with finite precision, finite uh, uh, ability to resolve, I mean uh, represent numbers. So, that is what I added the sentence that this cannot be computed for very large times. <coughs> this um, is the sort of a description of the physical stability and instability of the system. We have to now compare this physical uh, property with uh, what you are doing numerically. So, if I have a physically stable system, my numerical system also should be stable. It should not blow up. Of course, then we are not following the physics of the problem. So, that is what I said that the computed energy of a physically stable system must remain bounded. If it does go unbounded, then we are very much sure that there is something wrong with our numerical method. <coughs> Well, um, of course, um, we also would like to see if the solution is decaying at a particular rate. So, there is a given temperature uh, distribution, I should be able to also calculate it quite accurately. It is not necessary that I will say, okay, I have started with this initial solution and finally, I know everywhere temperature will be 0. So, let me rush through and get to that solution. Then what will happen? The solution at the intermediate stages, they will not be accurate. right? So, time accuracy is a uh, attribute of a good numerical solution and uh, the last one that I mentioned here is called consistency. We will see what we mean by consistency is the solution has some physical property. I would like to represent it numerically in a sense that it does not violate those physical principles. Suppose as I uh, explained here that d d t is negative, then what does it mean? The energy will slowly come down. It does not say that energy should keep oscillating up and down, but if my numerical solution shows that kind of a attribute, then I am perhaps not solving the correct set of equation by a correct method. Maybe the equation is correct, but the method is faulty, because I am not consistent to what I see physically. So, that issue we will be talking about maybe today itself. I <coughs> will give you a concrete example. So, let us now go through this. This is something which with which we are familiar, right? Uh, we are solving this equation u t equal to u x x, then uh, the time derivative here, we are doing it by Euler time integration. That is what we meant by forward in time. So, we are at jth time level, we are trying to find out the solution at j plus 1th level. So, that is where this forward in time uh, phrase comes in there. <coughs> And the second derivative u x x has been uh, derived here also by a central scheme. So, that is why we have this acronym called F T C S standing for forward in time centered in space. If you now uh, compare this with uh, say the 1D wave equation that we have been looking at for so long, there this method was unstable, right? But here what happens? Let us try to see. Now, I have written down the leading truncation error term in time discretization that is proportional to the second derivative and it is also uh, proportional to the time step. So, this is a basically a first order accurate in time, right? you agree with me and this is the part which we had uh, quite a bit of discussion. In terms of h, I will say it is a second order, 
in terms of the order of the polynomial, I will say it is a third order, right? does not matter. So, uh, let us uh, try to now analyze this. So, numerically what we do? Of course, we drop out all these truncation error terms. We write this term is equal to this term and then I would have a quantity called k 1 by h square that is like your delta t by delta x square and this has a name called the Peclé number. So, we will call this as a Peclé number which uh, defines the ratio of the time step by the space step squared. Now, let us uh, follow our spectral representation of the unknown. So, what I would do is I express the x variation in terms of the corresponding wave number. To avoid confusion that is why I wrote here k 1. So, you understand k 1 refers to delta t, k here is the wave number. <coughs> now, as before we can also define a, an amplification factor which will be this uh, Fourier Laplace amplitude evaluated at the advanced time divided by the same value at the prior time step. <coughs> now, if I uh, take this um, representation and plug it in there, then from here I will get u of k t plus delta t, right? j plus 1 will give me t plus delta t, right? And uh, u i j here will give me u k t, right? And of course, this k 1 has gone upstairs and divided by h square gives you the Peclé number. And uh, what I have here, u i plus 1 I could write it as e to the power i k h times u of k t that we have done in the last few classes, you know how to handle that. 2 u i j uh, is nothing but simply 2 into u k t and u minus 1 j will be e to the power minus i k h u k t. So, having obtained this uh, difference equation in the k t space, I could divide both sides by u of k t. If I do that, then uh, what do I get? Well, um, this one here, this divided by u k t will give me g, right? Then I will have minus 1 and on the right hand side, I will have the Peclé number and uh, what about this? e to the power i k h plus e to the power minus i k h that will give me 2 cos k h and there is this minus 2, right? And that is what we have. So, what I am getting here then g of uh, this algorithm which I called as FTCS would be equal to 1 plus what about this I could take 2 out right out I could also write 1 minus cos minus 2 sin square. So, I could write here with a minus sign I will write it here as 4 p sin square k h by 2. Okay. <coughs> So, that is uh, precisely what you see written over there as equation 7. Now, uh, what do we want numerically? Numerically, we do not want g to be greater than 1. If g is greater than 1, then it is numerically unstable method, right? So, we cannot afford to have that. That part g uh, value uh, exceeding 1 is uh, out of question because you can see it is 1 minus 4 times this. So, this is a positive quantity 1 minus 4. So, uh, the whole quantity has to be less than 1. So, Peclé number of course, is positive it is a time step by uh, space step squared. So, it is positive. So, the solution will not grow monotonically. What does it mean? If g is greater than 1 then every time it keeps on growing retaining the same sign. So, that is what I mean by monotonic growth, right? So, if I have Peclé number as Peclé number is positive, this is assured if uh, uh, g is less than uh, plus 1. <coughs> However, if I have the value of g lying between 0 and 1, then what will happen? Then the solution will not grow and it will slowly come down retaining the same sign because g has a plus sign. So, you should see the solution decaying monotonically. However, as uh, this g is uh, if I 
try to plot uh, g versus uh, k h. So, we have seen the upper bound is plus 1. So, that is uh, always satisfied. Now, if g is uh, between 0 and 1, I could have some solution like this. right? So, this what we are doing, we are fixing some value of Fekele number and then we are plotting g versus k h. This can happen that it, uh, for small value of k h, what happens? When k h goes to 0, of course, this part goes to 0, you get 1 and that is why we start from 1. right? And as k h keeps increasing, slowly it comes down. And you can see there would be a limiting value of k h uh, for which this 1 minus 4, this quantity is going to be 0. So, this value also you can locate what is the k h for which the g is 0. right? So, if I have my g bracketed in between this, then the solution will monotonically decay. But then what we are seeing that for higher values of k h, it can take a negative value. right? So, that is this condition that we have talked about here uh, b that uh, I could have a situation where g is less than 0, but bounded on the bottom side by let us say minus 1. So, this is my minus 1 line. So, I could just simply come up like this. So, in this range what happens? Solutions still decay because g is less than 1 modulus, but what happens? Every time you do that you multiply by g, so you switch sign. right? So, that is what I said that you will have a solution that will decay, but in an oscillatory fashion. Now, this figure also shows the possibility that I could go below minus 1 also. And if I do that, then what happens? That means numerical instability. Please do not confuse it with physical instability. We are talking about physically stable system and we are looking at the property of the numerical method. So, these are the possibilities determined by the value of g. So, this case, case c is the case is uh, what we do not like to happen, where solution actually blows up. <coughs> now, um, as you can see, this sin square k h by 2 at the most can be 1. right? So, if I want to achieve this condition that g should lie between 0 and 1, this is assured. I only have to see where it becomes equal to 0. And as I showed you, that would happen if you can keep your Peckley number here less than one fourth. If you do that, you are assured. So, this is a sort of a limit prescribed to you to keep your calculations stable. So, to solve, use this method and solve this equation, you should uh, endeavor to keep this Peckley number less than one fourth, then you will have a solution which will decay monotonically. Right. Now, if I also want to allow this possibility that not only there, I want to go from here to here. So, start from here. So, I, I would like my solution to be bounded between minus 1 and plus 1. So, that means achieving A and B simultaneously. How can that happen? Well, I have to see what is the additional range of Peckley number I can uh, allow so that uh, I can go and reach up to here. That you can very clearly see that that will happen if I put this equal to minus 1, right? then you will see the Peckley number should be equal to half. So, what happens is you have the following uh, recipe in front of you now. We are saying that if we keep the Peckley number less than one fourth, then we will have a decaying solution which will retain its sign at every time step. But if I keep my solution, uh, the Peckley number between one fourth and one half, then solution will still decay, but it will flip sign every time step. right? <coughs> so, you can now uh, understand uh, what, what it does. Now, before I uh, go to anything else, let me also point out one interesting aspect that if you look at the leading truncation error term, from the time derivative we had this term. 
k1 k1 by 2 into utt and if you look at uh, the space discretization that was h square by 12 into fourth derivative right however uh, what happens ut is equal to uxx so i can find out utt will be this fourth derivative of u with respect to x so this uh, two quantities are essentially same so i can just take it out and then what i see inside a quantity which is k1 minus h square by 6 what does it mean that if i choose my time step k1 in such a way that k1 is equal to h square by 6 then this leading truncation error term will be zero so that would uh, give you the additional degree of freedom where the error is further minimized right so this method was suggested by milne so this is called the milne's method <coughs> now think of uh, the i mean uh, the consequence of such a uh, re requirement what we found out so what is this 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 means that the peclet number should be less than 1 sixth right so if you can keep your peclet number less than 1 sixth then you will not only get uh, a solution which will monotonically decay but it will also give you more accurate solution right so this is what we do and what you could do is you realize that your g that uh, expression that we have written there are functions of two parameters one is the peclet number other one is the wave number k h non dimensional so what we could do is we could represent the help of this method by plotting uh, g contours in uh, peclet number k h plane and uh, what you notice here though that uh, there is a line here that is your g equal to 0 line anything above this line uh, on this side they are all unstable okay so they are all uh, less than minus 1 so you are forbidden to go there you can stay in this region but you also realize that depending on the choice of your peclet number means depending on your choice of time step you can only resolve those k h which lies below that g equal to 0 line right so well actually we should be drawing a g equal to minus 1 line basically that is your uh, stability limit so basically what we are saying that if i want to represent all k h values faithfully without incurring any instability or error then my peclet number should be very small because you see this last line that we have drawn here it is 0.99 what does it mean means that every time step you are computing your solution is decreasing by 1 percent so if i use this method in a matter of 100 steps you can see that i am actually incurring so much of error so what you ideally want recall back what we said ideally we always want g should be equal to 1 so you can see that uh, this method uh, this forward in time centered in space scheme is a quite a restrictive method and if i now go back to the stencil how do we do it operationally operationally it is like this that uh, i will uh, try to get the solution in the x t plane ok <clears throat> now if I uh, write this index as j and the next line is uh, j plus 1 and let us call this as i and this is i minus 1 and this is uh, i plus 1. So, what does this uh, discrete equation difference equation tells us that u i at j plus 1 that means this point solution depends on u i j the point just below. So, I will mark it there and this three points they are also one level below. 
So basically what you are getting is a computational molecule of this shape. So this is how you uh, get to solve the problem. And what is the attribute of this method? That at each and every point I can explicitly work out the value here because we already have the information at the, this time step. So that is why this method is called the explicit method. Okay? Um, this is a sort of a rule of thumb as we will also prove and show that all explicit methods have this kind of uh, restrictions like what we have talked about. Uh, as we saw in that figure to be uh, close to g equal to 1, we really need to keep uh, Peclé number very, very small, very, very small. We are talking about say 10 to the power minus 3, 10 to the power minus 4. And what is Peclé number? Peclé number is uh, basically your delta t by uh, delta x square. So what happens is, suppose I take delta x as 0 0.01, what is delta t? This is of the order of 10 to the power minus 4. So you can see that uh, how much of a refined time step you will have to adopt to be able to compute. right? And not only that, I mean we have to keep the Peclé number for accuracy reason if we adopt Milner's method, that itself should be 1 6. So your time step will be further reduced. So these sort of uh, restrictions keep piling up one over the other and makes this uh, method a uh, little difficult to use. Before we go any further, let us try to see what happens if we do not have Dirichlet condition, but instead we have the Neumann condition that is something like a derivative condition. If you recall the problem that we are talking about, if this is my x plane, then I was talking about a let us say rod here. Okay? So, this is x equal to 1 and this is x equal to 0 and then we have some kind of boundary conditions given at this end and at that end. Right? That is the problem that we are solving. So, when I say I am solving u t equal to u x x, uh, this could be one of the representation. <coughs> Many a times what you could do if it is a engineering problem, you can put it at a constant temperature bath. Right? You can fix the temperature. If I fix the temperature, then I will get the Dirichlet type of condition. Right? I am fixing the function itself. However, many a times what you do, you have all done thermodynamics, most of you are hopefully. You know that you also have this kind of conditions where you say, well, I will keep it insulated. I will not allow any heat transfer to occur from one at the end. If I do that, then what will happen? Then I will basically saying something like this, uh, Q is some, uh, well, um, uh, I should be careful into see this is the heat transfer rate and suppose I put this equal to 0 then I am basically giving a condition on the derivative and that is what we are calling as Neumann condition kind of. So this is quite common for a heat transfer problem having a Neumann condition is a very routine uh, state of affair. So, uh, that is what we are saying. Say for example, the heat equation we have on the left boundary, let us say we put uh, del u del t is equal to some f of t. Then uh, how do I uh, solve the problem? Well, what is the problem? Well, the problem uh, is the following. Let us look at the computational molecule and how we go about solving it. So basically what we are doing, I will uh, talk about the solution in the xt plane and this is my, let us say, one of the boundary that is equal, say let us say, uh, corresponds to x equal to 1 and this is a uh, condition at x equal to 0. And then we have seen that uh, if we look at uh, two lines, well, few lines, uh, time lines, and the corresponding uh, space uh, discretization by lines of this kind, then uh, what we have seen 
that we have a computational molecule which is uh, something like this. <coughs> now, that equation that we had written was this u i uh, j plus 1 uh, is equal to u i j and what, what do we have there? Plus Kekle number into u i plus 1 j minus 2 u i j plus u i minus 1. Okay. So, this is our uh, strategy. So, at suppose I give you the solution at t equal to 0, then what do you do? You go to the next line and what you see is you would if, if say a, a Dirichlet condition is given to us, then this is already known to us. right? Then I will start using this equation from the second point onward. So, you can see applying a uh, Dirichlet type of boundary condition is much more easier, because we can then straight ahead start from here. This solution would depend on this value, this value and the next value. Then I will come to the next point and so on and so forth I could do. However, what we are seeing here that here the boundary condition given on the left hand is given in terms of a derivative. So, this solution itself is not known to us. So, what do we do? Well, of course, we have been given uh, del u del x at let us say i equal to 1 equal to 0. And what do we do? I could just uh, since we are doing center in space, I could also write this like this. So, what I will write u. Uh, so, I am trying to evaluate the condition here. If I try to do a central difference, what I need? A point to the right and also a point to the left. Point to the left does not exist physically. So, that is what we do is we add a fictitious line which I have shown here by this dotted line. So, this dotted line that you are seeing here is what is called as the ghost boundary. So, we add a extra line here. Okay. So, this was uh, let us say i equal to 1. So, I am basically introducing a line i equal to 0. Right. So, this is my ghost boundary. Now, what I should be doing? The difference equation that we have, where would we apply it from? We start applying it right from i equal to 1. Okay. Then, what happens? If I apply this, what do I get? u 1 j plus 1 should be equal to u 1 j plus Peclé number on u 2 j minus 2 u 1 j and plus u 0 j. Now, your worry is this does not exist, right, but I could do this. What I could do? I am trying to find it out at i equal to 1. So, I will write it as the point to the right. So, this if it is like this, I will write it as u 2 j minus u 0 j by 2 delta x that is equal to 0. Right? That is what this condition means. That means what? Uh, this gives us some, well, what we have taken is not 0, let us say we have taken it like f. So, let us keep it f of t. Then what I get from this equation then is I will uh, be able to write u 0 j is nothing but u 2 j minus 2 f into delta x. Right? So, I have uh, used the boundary condition to relate the fictitious point with some point in the inside. Right? So, we can do that and then what I do is I require it here. So, I will just simply use it here. So, what happens now in this equation? Of course, 
you are trying to find out the solution at the uh, next time step, everything is known because this u0 is nothing but related to u2. Hmm? And your boundary condition is also prescribed, so f is known, so you can actually use it. So, this is uh, what is being demonstrated here in the slide that if I have derivative boundary condition, I uh, call that as the Neumann boundary condition and I used up that boundary condition uh, writing this equation what I have written here as uh, uh, y y. So, with the derivative boundary condition you start applying the difference equation right from the first point in the physical boundary because that is where you do not even know the solution you know the derivative condition. So, you need to know the temperature there also. So, that is what we do and we end up getting what we call as the ghost boundary right. So, this is something that uh, we need to know how to handle derivative boundary conditions. Now, uh, we made the comment that uh, FTCS method is restrictive in terms of uh, allowable time step, in terms of accuracy. So, of course, uh, various people who are the vanguard of uh, this uh, development of this subject, uh, one of them was uh, Louis Fry Richardson from Cambridge and uh, he was uh, so very optimistic about the future of this subject that he wrote a book in I think 1904 or 1903 saying how weather will be predicted very soon. So, he wrote a book uh, then and there uh, and he actually was also looking at this problem and he said look we have a problem for the FTCS method in terms of accuracy. So, if we increase the order of the method there is a chance that we will have a better accuracy. And uh, that led him to suggest that look, we are doing second order accurate in space, right? If I look at in terms of h square, right? So, why not make the time discretization also second order accurate? So, what happens? What I would do, I, if I am looking, I applying this equation at j, I will take the solution one level up related to one level below, right. Uh, this has a alternative name also. This is what is also called as the leapfrog method. Well, those of you maybe some of you have uh, played this uh, games child's play like uh, they call this leapfrog or hopscotch method. You have heard of you know people jump from leaving one square alternatively and jumping it is something like your checkers game. So, that is exactly what is uh, suggested in this method. So, what happens? Well, you could now look at the difference equation, use the same methodology of analysis that we have looked at so far. So, we define g and what do I get? From here I will get u i j plus 1 divided by u i j that should give me a g. What about this? What I am saying that if I have a term like this uh, and relate it uh, with uh, this, this relationship should come via the g, right? Because the Fourier amplitude is uh, related by g. What happens when I am looking at i j minus 1 and trying to relate it with i j, what happens? Then it will become 1 over g. See that is what happened here. If I divide both sides by u i j, this will be u i j minus 1 by u i j. So, that would give me this 1 over g. So, you can see this term will give us g, the next term will give us 1 over g. We just take this 2 on the other side and everything remains as before. Now, what happens? You have now two roots g 1 and g 2 given by this. Well, you do not need to even solve it to find out what is happening, but you can very clearly see it is a quadratic with the last term, the product term of the root is minus 1, is not it? You can see that, that g square minus 1 into 4 e into this. So, g 1 into g 2 is minus 1. So, what does it mean? If one of them is less than 1 stable, the other one has to be unstable. So, without even solving you know here is a 
uh, naive approach just because you apply a higher order method does not mean that you are going to get what you want more accuracy faster calculation stable calculations no here is an example where you actually end up in trouble well if you don't believe me you can uh, use up writing a small program and find out this g1 and g2 contours so g1 expression we have seen uh, given by 9a and g2 is 9b so if i look at uh, g1 this is what i get now what happens is this picture is uh, somewhat reminiscent of what we did for ftcs the only thing is here all the lines are shifted to the right because it is more accurate method so every line actually got shifted there now even this line you are seeing it's still plus 0 0.05 so zero line would be even further on this side so unstable region for g1 has been shifted on that side and you can also see that the last line i have shown here it's actually triple nine point nine 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 so every time step you are accumulating error of 0.1 percent okay so you would say okay i mean there is an improvement so why why are we complaining well we are complaining because of this other part look at this g2 and you can see right there this line is less than minus one so this g2 mode is unstable mode so when you are actually going to compute it's going to be a combination of g1 and g2 one mode is more stable the other mode is violently unstable so net result is you will not be able to use this there is this other thing also you must understand that uh, this happened because we tried to use a method which required information at three time level that's why we ended up with a quadratic in g if you recall in ftcs we got a single value of g because there was just a linear relation right g is equal to 1 minus 4 p sin square k h by 2 but here instead we got a quadratic so we get one mode the g1 mode which resembles the actual physical mode whereas the g2 is an attribute of our numerical method so we'll call this as a numerical mode or non-physical mode and it's spurious it does not exist it has come about because of our numerical strategy so uh, we conclude that despite its promise of higher accuracy with respect to FTCS method, this is essentially an unstable method. So, uh, please do not be uh, uh, taken in by any such claim that higher order methods are better methods. Always you will have to come back to the drawing board, do your own analysis, find out whether it works fine or not. And we have learnt our lesson that always you may not get the same thing. Now, this is a method which was pioneered by these two gentlemen, Dufort and Frankel. And uh, what they did was uh, somewhat uh, very, very suspicious. You can see the equation 10. What has been uh, uh, changed compared to, let's say, the other method, that uh, Richardson method? What did we do there? So there, uh, this was the Richardson method, right? So, Richardson method is written like this. Now, what Dufort and Frankel realize that uh, that method is unstable. So, they said, Let, let's play a trick. What we do is, instead of this quantity here, which is uh, this point, what I do is I take it as this as average of these two points. Right? That's what they have done. You see, 2ij has been replaced by uij plus 1 and uij minus 1. Well, this looks ad hoc. So, of course, we don't uh, uh, let it uh, lie there just like that and we can go ahead and start investigating. And once again, you will agree with me, it's a three time level method because you have j minus 1, j and j plus 1. So, you end up with a quadratic in G and that is what you have here, right? Okay, it looks 
somewhat a little more daunting and complex, but you can get this. You simplify it, you get this quadratic and you get these two roots. Now, this is uh, something that we uh, should uh, pause and ponder is our method demands g to be what? A real quantity. We are looking at a solution which is monotonically decaying. We do not want it to oscillate, right? So, g should be real. But, if you look at this expression here, this quantity under the radical sign depending upon your choice of Peclé number and depending on the k h that you are looking at, that quantity can become negative and when you take a square root, what will happen? You will get a g which will be complex. So, what happens? You started looking at uh, a solution which should have been monotonically decaying with t equal to constant, but here you are going to get uh, a sort of a oscillatory solution. Okay? <coughs> And uh, what you could do actually, you could write down the Taylor series expansion for this uh, equation 10, which we will do. And we will show that if we are not careful in choosing the spatial uh, steps with the time step, our actual equation act can turn out to be hyperbolic. So, in trying to solve a parabolic equation, uh, somewhat careless uh, approach like what has been suggested here can lead us to a parameter space where the solution actually becomes hyperbolic. And this is a problem of consistency. This is what I meant by consistency. If I want to solve a problem which is parabolic in nature, solution should follow that principle faithfully. If it does not, then we have an inconsistent method. And Dufort Frankel uh, method has to be handled rather carefully. So, you have to ensure you have to choose your Peclé number in such a way that the last uh, relation is uh, not uh, violated, so that you get uh, truly real values of G 1 and G 2. And we can actually uh, work it out. We can work it out once again uh, in Peclé number k h plane and uh, this is your G 1 contour and you can see various uh, values here uh, like what we had seen before, but I have also drawn a line here which is uh, this thumb shape which is blue in color. Inside that region, you have that uh, quantity negative. So, that is where your G 1 will have a, a complex uh, value somewhere in this uh, region, thumb shape region. Outside it is real. So, outside there is no problem. So, what you need to do is you can actually choose a value of Peclé number, critical Peclé number. If you keep it below, so you are on this side, so you have no problem of being inconsistent. You will be inconsistent only when you take larger k h, then some ranges of k h will display hyperbolic wave nature whereas other values of k h will display parabolic nature. right? So, this is your g 1 contour. You can uh, also similarly look at the g 2 contours and uh, this is what we get. Needless to tell you that uh, g 2 is the numerical mode, it is not there physically. right? Why, why, why do we call it a numerical mode? Physically, why should we expect that uh, g should be only 1? Pardon? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, what he said is the following that look, in the limit delta t going to 0, you are actually looking at the lo I mean local time. You are, you are, numerically, you may take three time step or five time step as much as many as you want, but your definition of derivatives, continuum derivatives relates it to the derivatives to be calculated at that time. And that is why you should always 
try to avoid this temptation of involving more than two time levels. Right? So, this is something that we see for the Richardson method as well as Dufort Frankel method that we do end up having a spurious numerical mode. And once again I told you the region inside the blue curve is where we have the hyperbolic equation and outside this term the algorithm represents the original parabolic problem. But you also realize that um, this mode values actually you will see it, uh, it is loaded now you can take a look at download the material and you can see that um, most of the small values of k h for very small values of Peclet number they are close to 1. So, it does not hurt very much. That is why Dufort Frankel method has been uh, introduced sometimes if I am not wrong some, sometimes in 30s or 40s and you may actually even do a little bit of search and you will find that there are still people who use this method. But you have to be careful because you have to really take Peclet number very small otherwise this spurious mode is going to really hurt your solution because if I take larger value you see this is 0.2 line sorry 0.3 line then this is 0.4 line and so on and so forth. So, you can actually uh, get into a problem where you may lose physical information. Why do I say that? See the fact is any time I prescribe you some initial condition and you have two modes what does the solution do? The solution distributes this initial energy into these two modes right and if one of the mode keeps on damping it by factor of 80 percent every time step that part of the solution is lost. So, your initial condition information is irreversibly lost right and uh, those of you I do not know how many of you have uh, taken a course on a topic called chaos dynamics uh, there they swear by initial condition they say like there are many many physical systems including our weather. If I make a very small error in the initial condition after some time the solution diverges from the actual solution. So, you understand that uh, this multi uh, level methods have this uh, perennial problem of invoking uh, spurious numerical modes. They can take away a chunk of initial conditions and the resultant solution despite uh, the other part being physical still would be deficient and wrong. right? So, this is something uh, that we should always keep remembering and this is what I said look we can also do a Taylor series and see what happens. The left hand side that we have here we is nothing but del u del t plus k 1 square by 6 the third derivative then k 1 to the power 4 by 120 fifth derivative and so on and so forth and the right hand side gives you this. So, what happens is when you equate this you get an equation of this form. What is this beta? Beta is you can see here k 1 square by h square. So, that is we have called it here as beta square and uh, we also have this path last part of the solution where if I call k 1 square by h as gamma then this part is this. Now, what happens? You look at the limit that your k is k 1 is small well that should be k 1 the k 1 is small h is small. So, what should you expect? You should get back to your continuum equation. However, if in the process if k 1 by h remains a finite value it is not 0 then what happens? This term remains right this beta square term will not go away despite the fact that individually k 1 is vanishing, h is vanishing, but their ratio is finite. So, what happens? That is your wave equation. Any time you have a second derivative of time related to second derivative of x, you end up like what you have seen that D'Alembert's wave equation. So, you, you do not believe me, you do not need to believe me, you just plug in the trial solution u is equal to some i k x minus omega t and convince yourself that you are getting a real dispersion relation that would imply it is a hyperbolic equation. So, we concluded that Dufort Frankel method is not consistent if beta is finite even though k 1 and h may go to 0.
right so i stop here